Someone once said that our life is just a centimeter on a meter rule. And we've got all of that um, space that none of us ever think about because we are so fixated on what's happening in the centimeter. So I'm asking us to focus on that big part. But in order to get to that place, we must pass through this whole experience of the corporate world, isn't it? And so we'll be speaking to that too as well. Second Peter 3.11 says, Since all these things are thus in the process of being dissolved, what kind of person ought we to be in the meantime in consecrated and holy behavior and devout and godly qualities? Second Peter 3.11 and now we can begin. So, my commitment is to paint in very broad strokes how we prepare for eternity with principles that are entirely mine. I didn't read them from anywhere. Um, this, this, is, this is my pain. I'm speaking to my, my pain, my challenges, and how they've affected me and how we can focus on them. But my prayer is that when we finish looking at them, even though they take us towards eternity, the truths in them would ring true also for our corporate life and experience. So, ten things to consider on our way to eternity. Is that fair? So, leadership, don't get too angry. Um, this, is, this is a, a, a nice bargain. So, 10 things to consider on our way to eternity. The very first one, and my mind goes to that declaration that those Hebrew boys made on the plain of Jura when they had been put in a furnace that was seven times heated. It was so hot that the people who even heated the furnace died from the heat coming from the furnace. Does anyone remember the statement they made? When Nebuchadnezzar, who absolutely liked this young man, wanted to give him a second ch chance, and he said, you know what? We'll play the music again. You bow when you hear it. What did they say? Anyone? Oh. This is Nas. So I'm not standing at uh, another... This is Nas. Anyone? You are going to have to forgive my word today. Today at the office, they said, rep your school. And so I dressed down for that. Um, and so I rep my school. So I just grabbed a jacket to throw on top of it. So forgive if it's offensive to you. Sorry. But who remembers what those Hebrew boys said? Yes. Read it out. Don't worry. If that is the case, that's how I started there. Okay, so, so some translations say, No, O King. Basically, I say, Look, you have given us an opportunity, we are grateful, but it changes nothing. Know that even if you burn us here, we know a God who we serve, who can save us. But even if He does not save us, it doesn't change the story for us. You need to be able to have that stance in your life now. As you get into the corporate world, one of the things you need to establish is what you trust in, what you believe in. One of the things that has come up is a, it's, it's not a recent phenomenon. It's been happening for a long time. It's just that now they are more open about it. And so many people join all these societies, cults, and all of these things to be able to advance themselves in the corporate world. As Adventist students who are preparing for that one, right now as you stand here, it's easy to make this commitment. All of us trust the Lord implicitly. And that's because we haven't come up against any challenge. 
And maybe some of you have come against challenges and faced it and so you trust him. But one of the places that I, I need you to, the very first thing I need us to understand is that you must make this declaration now. You must take this stance now. Not tomorrow, not a month from now, not two months. Your trust in God must be total. Total because you are going to come against circumstances that challenge who you are and what you believe in. It's going to, there are things that are going to shake you to your core. And it's going to require you to take a stance on what you believe. Ten things on the way to eternity. The very first thing is make that declaration now. Take a stance for where you want to be. You need to take a stance that is saying, even if this happens, this is who I am. Even if I don't get that job in the first seven years of my life, this is who I am. Hello? Am I making sense? And this is a stance you must reinforce over and over again because making it once is not it. Very many times, even after years in the corporate world, you need to make this stance. So if there's nothing else that you do, you must come to this point. And the reason is this. Throughout this past quarter, we've been studying about what? Rest. And what is the underpinning thing for rest? It's a confidence in a God who cannot fail. A confidence in a God who has already won that battle. And so you know for a fact that even when everything in the world looks upside down, <laughs> I will still win. I, I don't know if you get it. I was giving this example a few days back to someone about rest. How many of you are football people? I'm not at all. I don't care who wins or loses in any league on earth. Um, and if I had to support a team, it is Accra has of Oak. But for those of you who are football people, if you remember the European finals in which Liverpool played, I think it was about seven, six years ago. I can't remember. But it was, it was historical it, because they had played almost 90 minutes and they, had, they were down by how many goals? Three goals. Hey, there's someone who doesn't walk alone here. So, everybody, I mean, anyone who was a Liverpool fan was on the edge of their seats. It was done. It was over. There was less, less than 10 minutes of play and it was done. And miraculously, I mean, I have watched that match. I had to watch it, not because I like football, but I just had to understand what it took for people when everything was down to find in themselves the capability to challenge the odds. And so just for learning purposes, that is one of the most amazing matches in the history of football. True or false? What did they do? With less than six minutes to the end of the game, those guys came out from under and won the European Cup. Remember? Now, for those who were too scared to watch it, they finally watched it the next day. I don't know. If you know, if you know football fans, who are, those people who can collapse when they score one goal, they didn't watch it that night because they would have died. They would have been buried long before the outcome would have come. So they watched it the next day. But can you imagine the Liverpool fan watching it the next day? Throughout the first 90 minutes of despair, why was he still watching it? Because he knew the end of the story. That's who we are. Adventist Christians know the end of the story. So you must have rest. And that's why this is important. Alright, let's move quickly on. Ah, Learning to wait purposefully. Many, many years ago, I attended a job interview. Well, it was supposed to be an initial meet before the interview. But I remember waiting for almost five hours for the person to finally decide to see us. And by the time he got there, I mean, some of the people waiting for the interview had started to... I mean, we're angry. I mean, seriously, because we're waiting for a job, so me that they are taking my book 
Anytime I am going anywhere where I know there's going to be waiting, I have something to read. You cannot waste my time. I have something to read. I have something to write about. I've got a plan in my head that I need to execute. I remember even those days when we used to go to a certain bank that will remain unnamed because I'm a competitor. Those days you had to use passbooks to go and pick your money from the bank. And when you arrived at the place, because you know, those days banks were banks. It's not like today that we are running around chasing everybody. Those days when you go into a banking hall, the teller was God. And you waited in a queue for as long as they said wait. So those days I would take a book. And I remember my branch was in Osu. And I'll just look for the quietest part of the bank here because those are the times where they will call you by your number. So I'll go and pitch in a corner and I'll just wait. I need to take about two hours before I saw the teller. I need to be three hours before I left the place. And I was not going to waste my time. So I'd read. One of the things that you must truly build into a superpower, especially if you are like me and you didn't have any god parents or strong or powerful friends of your father or mother is learn how to wait. Well, five years back, um, my family needed to move. We had to travel out because I was working somewhere else. And I came in. I had two weeks to renew the passports for two of my children. And so I had gone through the process, the, all the whole protocol things, and it was just not working. But finally, I found someone who said that, they, who, who said they knew someone, you know, Ghana. So I finally went to sit in this person's office. When I went, I went with my book, as usual. I, it was an iPad at that time, and I just sat in a corner. I introduced myself to the man, and I sat there in a the corner. So, I waited for him day one, nothing. I waited for two hours, and I told him, you know, I have to run. So I went. Next day I came again, and I waited again. So the person who introduced him called him and said, oh, um, has this gentleman come around? He said, yes, but he's been very busy. So the guy told him, ah, but do you know who he is? And so somehow they managed to tell him, I don't know why positions in Ghana change people's attitude. I can never understand that thing. I don't understand. But suddenly now he comes to apologize to me and I'm, I'm very disappointed that he had to know what I did to change how he treated me. But that's Ghana for you. Um, he comes and then suddenly in one hour he's able to fix my passport and promises the next When I came the next time with my daughters, he had, I mean, we were there for one hour. I didn't know that in Ghana we had that kind of ability to work that fast. How long does it take to get a passport these days? We changed it for my daughter in literally two days. Anyway, so that, that's another story. But one of the things he told my friend was, oh, when he came, he didn't say anything to me. He just sat in a corner and was reading. And he said, yes, that's me. He won't say anything to you. He expects you know what you're supposed to do. And doesn't have to beg you. The point I'm making is, if you don't understand or formulate your own superpower of waiting, you will die of anxiety, pain, and grief. One of the most painful things in Ghana, especially if you have to work with the public sector or any other business, where you are the person expecting service, is to learn how to wait. Um, I, I, I run constantly into my friends who have traveled into the diaspora and have come home, and I was standing there for more than three hours, and no one said anything to me, and they are slanging, and they are angry, and they are... <laughs> in Ghana, you must know how to what? You must know how to do what? But it's not just Ghana. In life generally, waiting is painful. Understanding how to deal with waiting is important. So that to be your superpower. But as Adventist Christian students, allow me to add that you must not just wait. Don't just read a book. Learn how to wait. We have one of these things here. Learn how to wait in prayer. So, anytime someone tells you to wait, don't get angry. Pray. 
Fill the space with prayer. Maybe you've been too anxious, so you have not even prayed enough about the thing. Pray. Learn how to wait in study. COVID was horrible, and many people were very angry. But there were those who also studied. Suddenly, across the world, colleges which offered premium education and people had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to do certain courses, they were being offered for free. How many of you knew that? How many of us took any courses from Harvard? You know, they offered it on EDX for free. They actually have now come up with what they call a micro bachelor program. I, if you have not studied it, all those courses you wanted to go and do in Harvard, they are online for free today. Don't wait painfully. Right? This is like the best and worst of times. Best times because you can access education from anywhere. Don't wait in anger or pain or insulting. Don't waste your time. Build yourself. So wait in study. Study also your Bible. Go through your spirit of prophecy. Maybe for you, you never find time to do it. Anytime you're asked to wait, whilst you're waiting, do something purposeful. Work while you wait. One of the biggest things that's happened when we finish school and we're all looking for jobs. These days are far better. I, t- I kid you not. I remember those days when you see that the, all the jobs in the, that were available in Ghana came in the daily graphic. And when they announce it and you go, you meet the year groups before you who had not gotten jobs. All your mates that you traveled through education with and then those who were after you because you had waited at least a year. All of you are looking for that one job. Once you're waiting, you can teach. And I don't know why we don't. Because there are so many people who need it. Teach. Find something to do. I remember in the early time of, um, when I was looking for work and I wasn't getting it. I went to a company and I said, you know what? I want to volunteer to intern. Free of charge. You don't have to pay me anything. I didn't have a dime in my pocket, but I needed to start to do something. So work. Find opportunities. Don't sit and weep. While you wait, pray. While you wait, study. While you wait, work. You can. I love this one very much. I don't know. Um, Pastor, Pastor T.K. Mensah, some of you might know him, is organizing this 100 day of prayer and planting. Planning and planting. We had a vigil a few nights back and he shared something that was so important and it was so memorable that for me, I've chosen that as a text for this particular one because I shared it much earlier. For those of you who are in the KNUST NAS program, you'll notice that things have changed a little bit because something I've learned a few more things since then. But give the enemy no foothold in your life. Learn to pray. Now, I'm saying these things and all you're connecting them are with your walk with Jesus. And you're thinking that in a corporate world, these things don't exist. I kid you not. These three principles are important as you go into the corporate world. Many, many years ago, I let me see, this must have been 2003 or so, no, 2002. 2002. I, I, I have a small challenge. I'm, I've got a short attention span. I'm no better than my 10-year-old son. Um, I, I don't know how come, but... He, we can't, I, I can't do I can't do repetitive work for a long time. I just lose interest. Um, it's so bad that actually <laughs> sometimes if what you're doing or saying to me is repetitive, I can actually like go off and my mind wander. It's like a little boy. It's very sad, but 46 years and still, that's the problem I have to deal with. <laughs> but Many years back, when I had just joined the first bank I worked with, um, I'd gone through a lot of the material or products that we're supposed to deal with. I joined the International Trade Department, so it was LCs and collections and uh, export LCs and you know all those things in international trade. I'd gone through it very quickly, and I was I thought I, I started to get bored again, so I said. Well, there's a systems admin job I'd like to learn about so that I could just, you know, while away the time. So when my mind gets tired, I can move to something else. That's how I learn. That's how I work. I move in between all my various tasks so I never get bored. When I get to a point where that one starts to bore me, I go to the next one. 
And I come back and I do that. I do this uh, funny thing where I work for one hour, I play for 10. Work for one hour, play for 10. That's how I get my mind <laughs> to stay on track. So I started to do this uh, systems admin job. And it one fine day, we had gone through some, we had done some migration to some systems. It had been working very well. We had had some people come down from India. Everything was going well. So this evening, everybody had left, and I was supposed to run the systems, run the, this close of day thing, which allows all the accounts to reconcile and all transactions to hit the account so that everything is sorted out. And when we finished, it, it simply wouldn't work. It, it just kept running. I, I couldn't get it to stop. It had run, it was supposed to run for an hour and everything would be over. It had run for three hours and nothing was happening. I had checked all the things I'd been told to check. I'd placed my call to India. I'd called the guys who were in country. We were going through everything. It simply didn't work. When I finally looked at my watch, it was about 11 p.m. So I'd been at it for five hours and I was tired. I was saying, but God, what is this? Around midnight, I, I was totally worn out. And I remember going on my knees in the center of the department. It's this big room with all the decks there. And right in the middle, there was this walkway and I just went on my knees and I raised my hand and I said, God, I need you now. Not tomorrow. I need this thing solved now. Or tomorrow, six countries can't start their work. Come now. Not tomorrow. Now. And, you know, you've got, you've got all these CCTVs that play to make sure that things are happening. People are not doing mysterious things in the bank. So, someone calls me and says, um, me? <laughs> that was the next day. We saw you kneeling and praying. <laughs> what was happening there? <laughs> Were you running some crusade? I said, no, no, no. I was in trouble. I needed God. There are things that happen in the corporate dispensation that will scare you shitless. And that was something very easy. Today people take life because people are spoiling their deals. People take life because they are tough control people who will not let you steal. People make your life miserable simply because they have the power to do that. And it might sound funny. It may sound like well, we know about these things. There are people especially in the financial services who are dying. You know, it's, it's normal. It has nothing to do with healthy living or anything. The stress is so huge. People, you, you saw the person this morning, the next day they tell, oh, he passed. Oh, but I was talking to him. Oh, we went to exercise together. There's so much pressure. You need, first of all, to have rest from the God who you trust on the plane of Dura. You need to be able to wait through the trial of their constant assault. But you need to be able to pray. And I know you know these things already. But what I'm giving you is my view of what you need to survive in that world. So please don't give the enemy foothold. Learn to pray. Matthew 13, 24 to 30 talks about the enemy who comes to sow tears while you are asleep. I know you know that, that text. The prayer I'm exhorting you to is not the prayer that is reactive. I'm exhorting you to pray about your career even before it happens. Because there's an enemy who does not want you to get there and so he sows tears in your way. Don't wait until he has destroyed your opportunities before you start to pray. Start to confront him now whilst he's, on, whilst he's thinking that he's doing it on your blind side. Begin to confront him. Pursue excellence. And I love this one. Um, one of the characters in scripture who totally emulates this is Daniel. Daniel is believed to have had an excellent spirit. But this is a quality that will stand you good in any corporate environment. And excellence is deciding to be the best version of you each new day. This is not competition. You are not, whole, you are not looking at someone and making a decision. You are taking full assessment of who you are today and saying that when I get into the office tomorrow, I will be better than I was yesterday. And realizing that I have got 
four or five more hours of today left. What did I accomplish yesterday? Can I be a better version of yesterday? And excellence is that relentless pursuit where you don't stop, you never cruise, you don't take a break, you are constantly adding to yourself. And that's one thing that Daniel did. Have you thought about it before that Daniel survived four or so kings, was in government till 90, they didn't put him on retirement, and he was constantly so sharp that every king thought him relevant. He couldn't have done it by just being the big guy. It doesn't matter how powerful you are, your power ends. Daniel must have been so relevant that every king thought him worthy of keeping. So, if you're especially in the corporate world today where there are so few spaces, where there's not as much opportunity, excellence is given. Um, a former boss of mine told me that, um, and this was very early when I wanted to do an MBA, I think I just started working for about four years and everything. And he says, Ni, you can wait. And I said, why? I really want to do it now. Everybody's doing it. And he says, yes, everybody can do it. But don't waste your time. Focus on excellence. And I said, I, I didn't understand because I thought part of the excellence was also getting an MBA. So because of that boss's um, advice, I actually worked for, I think it was 2012. So I'd been working for about 11, 11 12 years before I actually ventured to my MBA. And he, he kept pushing me and saying every single day he wanted to come and find me doing something better or different from how I did it before. And I find that it is something that you need constantly to even keep you awake. Because there are many times that the drudgery of the job just sap all your energy and life out of you. And it requires you to personally instigate excellence. Well, you just take it for granted. For many people, they've been working for so long, they've forgotten why they are where they are. Now it's just that I wake up in the morning and I go and do this job and I come back and I you know, see my family and then I sleep and I go back to the job. For us, it cannot be like that. Especially, and like we read at the beginning, since the elements are to be dissolved, what kind of people ought we to be? Every single day must matter. Every single day must matter. So, pursue excellence. And as you do that, watch your health. Um, I'm, I'm learning this now because now I'm hypertensive. But I wish someone told me this when I was still in school. I would have taken it a lot more seriously. Don't play with your health. Someone, some, some, some research work has come out and said that between the ages of 70 and 79, your your internal organs deteriorate more than three times faster than they have throughout your whole life. So that if before you hit 70, you didn't watch your health well, you are going to get into quite a lot of trouble by 70. So watch your health. Keep the discipline of discipleship. And this is something that I found out. The things you're doing now that are keeping you close to God, stick with them. Um, when you start working all of that one, it takes, it takes grace and a lot of <laughs> a lot of prayer and forcing for you to continue to live like this. It's, right now you are so blessed because you are sheltered. There's a structure. In just a year or two, you'll be totally in charge of that structure. And if you don't have that discipline of discipleship now, you'll totally forget about it. So please Keep the display of discipleship. I'm going to move a little faster because I want to get to where we ask questions. Investing in you and other relationships matter. So, one of the things people always forget is that Jesus, when he came, the, the, one of the lesson studies that we've done in the past told us that he mingled. How many of you remember that one? Jesus was a mingler. He enjoyed to go among people and get to know them. He wanted to hear the backstory of their lives. He wanted to connect with people. And he didn't care what your age group was. Even for children who wanted to come to him, when he met with them, he became like a child and he, they were so excited with him. Now today we call this social capital. 
And if you live in Ghana and you don't invest in social capital, you're a very, 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 very disadvantaged person. It's not a joke, oh, this thing. People want to be known. They want to be acknowledged. So there's something called emotional intelligence. And unfortunately, so many people ignore it. Now, there are humans who can't help themselves. They simply can't be emotionally intelligent. But you can learn it. You can learn that uh, in a society or place where we are, there are certain things I must do to deepen the relationship I have with other people. And I say this for one simple reason. Many years ago, I was made head of distribution in one of the banks in Ghana. And when I joined, because it was such a large business, I was totally scared by the job. About 600 people directly reported into my role. And they... I, did, I, I, I was afraid about how to even deal with it. So I came in and I started out as this very authoritarian boss just to keep everything in order. We succeeded. We made some great strides. But several years later, after I'd grown a bit, I totally changed my leadership style. And I worked based on the fact that I knew my people better. And because I knew them better, I wanted them to relate with me on the basis of that friendship. Our output as an organization, because of that approach, more than tripled. In any organization, people work better when they know that you are connected to them. So yes, yeah, some people go to these organizations and because they don't want any trouble, they do not connect to anybody because I don't want you to kind of put me in trouble. I don't want to be in trouble. So you stay in your own space. In order to succeed, you need to invest in people. Every single person that comes to you or meets you must matter to you. It doesn't matter if he's a cleaner at the door or the boss. And indeed, it's not the boss you have to carry favor with. You know, there are some people who it's only when the person is the boss, then, yes, sir, uh, yeah, they suddenly become agreeable. But with everybody around you, everyone knows you are not agreeable. That's very bad. So you need to invest time. You know, you're at work. Yes, we all came to work. But spend time finding out who is this person? Where does he come from? What are his challenges? Why does he behave the way he does? When he's off color for that day, or she's off color, am I going to just pounce on them? Or am I going to understand them? When we invest in people, we get a lot more out of it. Some of the truths about this thing is we don't we don't know who you're you don't know who you are speaking to. When I say that, it doesn't mean you don't know their name and all of that. But life is such a funny thing that today you may be sitting next to this person. Five years from now, he could be your boss or you could be his boss. That's life. Can you imagine if his experience of you or your experience of him was all you knew about that this moment that you sat together? Do you understand? I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So many years ago, I sat in a flight with a gentleman. Didn't know him from Jack. But we sat, and since we we're going to be sitting next to each other for six hours, we decided to at least introduce ourselves and start talking. Didn't know him from Jack. But we had a one-hour conversation, and then we all knocked off and went to sleep. Many years later, I'm entering a company for business and I'm going to visit to talk about it. When I open the door, <laughs> this gentleman is right there. And it was a difficult proposition I was about to bring to this company. But just because of that one hour we had discussed in the aeroplane, we had moved past all of those barriers that exist because of what? Distrust. 
and began to have a conversation about what was really important. And it happens in different ways. A few years back, I was leading a company that had to go into the market to issue bonds. And it was a time when uh, non-bank financial institutions were in quite a bit of trouble in Ghana. So I went to, I was going to speak to this gentleman, walked into his office, we had a good conversation, and as we left, the gentleman said to me, Nee, don't worry, we will be helping you. I was comforted, but I said, well, okay. Yeah, I went my way. Many years later, he was telling this interesting story. And he said, I have a good friend who knows you very well. So then he calls the friend's name. I said, yeah, we're in secondary school together. And we actually worked at Stancha together. He says, yeah. He says, he says, that friend described you as a good man. I don't really see myself like that, but that's what his friend said. Then he says, and I know another person. And I called another friend who was a mutual friend. That person also said, you are a good man. By that time, my heart was racing. You know what I was thinking? What if each of these people had a totally different opinion of me? What if I had never connected with any of these people? That would have been the entire deal for a company that was life and death. People matter. Invest in people. And don't despise the small connections. I told you someone, oh, this, oh, it's just the janitor. Oh, this is the guy who cleans things in my office. <laughs> a friend told me a story how some people had decided to end his life in a certain organization and had poisoned stuff. Oh, yes, that's corporate Ghana too, by the way. Just as he was about to take the thing out of his fridge, the cleaner came, didn't see anything, pretended like he was going to pick the basket and said, boss, don't touch it too. I saw them putting something in it. Why would it have mattered to the cleaner? Every single day for the last four years he had worked at that office, when he came, he stopped to have a chat with the cleaner. How are you? How's your family? How many children do you have? Ah, Musa is now in this thing. Hey, well done, oh, congrats. Christmas, oh, madam says I should give this to you. Over four years. This, as far as this man is concerned, this is a good man. So when he saw people plan evil, he didn't keep quiet. Can you imagine if every day he walked past this man? Why should he risk his life to tell you? They could come and kill him too. He is a cleaner. Why should he risk his life? The point I'm saying is invest in people. It matters. And sometimes when we think that we are ahead of other people, we think that the people behind us don't need to. We don't need to connect with them. We are only looking at people in front of us. Life is funny and things change. I remember one fine day when one of my juniors became my boss. And everybody who was in the place knew that that was the fact because when he came the first day, we were talking and we were all talking about the fact that he was my junior in school. <laughs> so people asked me, why doesn't it worry me? I said, why should it worry me? God has put him on that track and he's headed in his direction. This is my track. We, what for, why should I worry about being in his track? Invest in people. It matters. Build a hunger for heaven. Get intoxicated about heaven. And please, I'm not sharing these things with you because I want to preach a sermon. I don't have a sermon to preach. I'm telling you that if you don't get intoxicated with heaven and the things of heaven, you will by all means be intoxicated with the other things around you. Believe you me, becoming the most powerful man or woman in corporate Ghana against the loss of your soul it's not even a measure to have. So, whilst you trot through corporate Ghana, keep your eyes on eternity. So, please, keep a hunger for heaven. And this hunger will still shine a light that lifts people around you. And the reason why I said build a hunger for heaven is this. 
Sometimes you will come into spaces within your work life where people are so bogged down by challenges. And in certain companies, all you can hear is complaint from morning to night. I don't know where you've heard of such companies. From the morning when they come, they complain. Ah. Then they go for lunch. Those are people who go for lunch around 10.30 and come back at 2 o'clock. Then they complain. Ah. And then by the time it's 4.49, they are setting off on their way home. When you have a hunger for heaven, you have rest from the beginning. You've been praying. <laughs> You've invested in people. And so, when people speak with you, your desires are not, the, are not corrupted by the things around you. And people will be speaking about you and saying, when I, ah, this person, when they work in their team, the place is always fun. Everybody is, you know, excited. Oh, knees team. Ha, that place when you go there, every time people are unhappy. Build a hunger for heaven. It shines a light that lifts people around you and points them and points the lost to a true beacon. That is Jesus. Now, the reason is this. When you invest in people, you are coming to a situation where you understand where people come from. So, you can speak to them about the gospel as you understand it. When you build a life, people begin to see that there's something about you that's different from all the other people they know. Whether you're a colleague, a subordinate, a senior. I don't... They're, 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 I've met colleagues, I've worked with people who were junior in an institution but had more influence than even the managing director. I remember this one so well. He was not the most senior person, but because he had worked in like four or five departments and somebody had, so many people had interacted with him, they had just gone to love him and gained affection for him that when there was a trouble in the firm, he could be the one who speaks up and everybody goes with his decision, even though the MD could not convince everybody to go with that decision. Build a hunger for heaven. God is seeking kingdom influencers, men and women who surrender their means and wealth to advance the cause of the kingdom. And I want you to understand this one now. So that as you start on your journey to life, you are poised for it. Some people wait till they are too old, too late in life before they want to give themselves as kingdom influencers. God is looking for people who will change the world as it is now. And you have to be a pastor to do that. You can be working in corporate Ghana. You can be working in different companies, in an NGO, in a financial institution, in government, wherever it is. But it's looking for kingdom influencers, people who are channels for wealth. If you are that kind of person or understand that kind of thing, begin to open up now so that God can teach you. Because there are many things you have to do to be able to get here. And one of the things that you want to do is to be people who understand that God's work needs to be done. And so you are committed to give yourself to it. God actually has, what, what does the Bible say? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Is that not so? And the earth is his footstool. He can channel wealth to people who want to, to use that wealth to support his business. So, if this is something that you are in, this is something you need to start praying about. Preparing yourself towards. Ah, I love this one. It's the case very often, unfortunately, and I don't know why, that Christian men and women typically become hermits from the world. I don't know why. You know what I'm talking about? Hermit. You know what a hermit is? Um, isolate themselves totally from the world. So you'll be speaking to Christian brothers and sisters who don't, they don't know how this works. They don't know how that works. They've never considered what cryptocurrencies do in the life of people. They don't care that the social media is doing something. Um, whether Instagram is coming to Africa, it doesn't matter. What is Twitter? Whether it says Twitter or Twitter, they don't care. Their own is that they are just focused on the word of God. And it's fantastic that you are. But if you want to succeed, if you want 
to understand the world already and impact it, please pay attention to how the world works. This is what made Daniel special. So if you, and, and this scripture alone, we are told that Daniel was a man of what? Science. Have you read that part? Did you know? He studied. He studied. He studied astrology. <laughs> he studied the chemistry of the times. He studied the medicine of the time. He studied interpretation of dreams. He studied all of these things. So that at the time that he was called, and the reason for this is this. Many people will be called into work and jobs that they are not necessarily educated for or qualified for. You know this. There are many people who are employed today not because of the degree, not because of a paper they, certificate they have, but because they have a certain understanding that is unique. So they are placed in job opportunities that have nothing to do. My, my first degree is in agricultural economics. I have not earned one CD in my life with agricultural economics. Yes, maybe with the discipline of agri the Agric Accounts Department in UG, which was a punisher and made me do 36 credits <laughs> a semester, which was madness. So it toughened me up. But the content, I haven't used it anywhere. When people hire me, it's because of what I do with teams. That's really why they hire me. So what are you doing? What are you understanding of how the world works around you that allows you to change or impact the world around you? Uh, am I making sense? Please feel free to stop me if I'm not making sense so because so I, I'm not wasting your time or anything. Please stop me. So be knowledgeable. Don't live an insulated life. But what's really important about this is that when you understand these things, you are able to bring the gospel to people in a manner that helps them understand your calling even better. Ah, I think my, one of my favorite topics in all of this. You are probably asking me what does marriage have to do with all of this? A lot. How do I put this? The fact that God created it in itself must matter to you. The fact that God instituted this means that you need to pay it attention. Marriage is serious business and requires serious consideration. I'm assuming that many of you are not yet married. Please, do not treat it as one of the projects in your life. Don't treat it like you are getting a job. Hello. Marriage is not one of those things. Though. Marriage can break you, sink you. The funny one that's killing me these days that is really worrying me is this conversation around being unequally yoked. And Many Adventist young men and women are marrying Adventist young men and women who are not equally yoked. The fact that you are coming to church every Saturday doesn't mean you are equally yoked. You might be coming to church, but you are of a different calling. Something very demonic. So, this is not something to be treated lightly. Right now, here, begin to pray about this. That's if you plan to get married. Don't wait till you find the woman. Or don't wait till you find the man. Don't wait till you meet a man that totally knocks you off your feet before you start the prayer. That prayer is useless because you have already decided. Don't wait till you, you see a woman that you want. Then you say, God, you are praying for endorsement. You are not asking for his will. I lie. 
please. December, I'll be married 17 years. So I'm, I'm telling you, I, like I told you, I'm going to share from the pains in my life. Do not make those mistakes. Marriage is important. If you marry poorly, and I'm not talking about wealth, I'm talking about making the wrong choice you will not have a successful corporate life. You will constantly be troubled and not be able to perform at the best of your ability. So take it seriously. Marriage will make you better through my test and trial. It will teach you patience. It will teach you sacrifice if you're a man or woman. It does not, if it does not show you the father's heart, his pain, and help you mature in your work, with God. And if you are blessed with children, you will experience some of what God feels for us. Don't enter it flippantly and for any cause save love's sake and God's sake. Many people marry out of consideration or convenience. There's nothing convenient. Marriage should not be for convenience. Because when you even marry the person you love the most, you can still end up divorcing. God has a secret formula for marriage. For the longest time, we've taken it for a joke. It's, in, it's right there in Galatians 5 onwards. Read it. Believe it. Put aside all these funny things that Hollywood and the intelligent people of the world are telling you. When it comes to marriage, only God's way works. So start to prepare for it now. When you leave this place, begin to dedicate prayer time towards it. And those are the 10 things I was thinking about talking about in terms of your preparation towards eternity. But I know some of you want to still hear something about this. So I'll share very quickly five things to catapult your corporate careers. Now that we understand the important things on our way to eternity, let's talk about some of the few things when it comes to corporate careers. So the first thing, there's no substitute for hard work. Do not cut corners. Hard work cannot be substituted. There's a certain part of your career where you will work hard until change comes. You will work hard until an opportunity opens. Some people are fortunate and opportunities open first. But when the opportunity is open, you work hard to sustain the opportunity. So please, if you have a challenge with hard work, understand that you are not poised to win. And I can't be more direct than that. Two, never cease learning. If you do, even failure, if, if you do, even failure will have great value. For people who are constantly learning, when you fail, it's just another lesson which you add to grow into success. And a fact, and I have failed many times, but I can't remember any failure that makes me stay. Why did I fail? I actually relish them. Because it's taught me some things never to do again. It's taught me how to do certain things better. If you don't stop learning, even failure will have great value. Find, this is my favorite one. And this has been one of the things that's helped my career. Find the path that no one wants to travel and excel on that path. You go into certain organizations and there are certain jobs some people have decided it's a useless job. Don't work with those people. It may be useless for you, but maybe God put it right there for you to walk into. And I remember this was my, in my very first job in the financial services sector. Walked into a place and they said, everybody run away from this particular role of the systems administrator thing because it was too much work. It meant you had to stay longer hours. You had to come in earlier than everybody. You, you were always going on some training or something. And nobody wanted to give that time. So I said, me, I like it. Give it to me. You see, when you take the unusual part, there are very few competitors. The assessment includes just you. It is your excel, your excelling that they used to measure the growth on that path. But if you rush into the space where everybody is present, you have to contend with everybody and the lenses through which they are looking are not necessarily always equitable. So, 
Find the unusual parts and excel in those ones. Stand for something. Understand every single time that you make a stand that you are building a brand. There are people who when they say, oh, he's worked for 20 years, people are thinking integrity. He's worked for 15 years, they are thinking competence. Every single stand you take, you are building a brand. So stand for something. Don't be one of those people who are flip-floppers. You know, today because everybody's talking about this, I'm here. Um, tomorrow, because it's very difficult and people don't like this one, then I'm here. People can never really tell who you are, where you stand, what to, what to do with you, if you matter, if you're someone who they should be speaking to. Stand for something. Let everybody know that when it comes to you, this is the only thing you will do. This is the only road you will tread. Stand for something. Finally, make meaningful connections. And this relates directly to the conversation around investing in people. Make meaningful connections. Forge heartfelt friendships and alliances. Show your heart. And I know many people actually run away from this because they are afraid that their hearts will be broken, that they will be hurt. Guys, we are human beings. If we don't hurt each other, what else will we do? Yeah, I don't know. So, yes. Get hurt. Learn. There are some men who never ask a lady out because they are afraid that she will say no. When she says no, what will happen? You will die. Just go and ask Mrs. Miss B or Sister C. Or go to Miss D and Sister F. You will not die. I assure you. I've been told no several times. I did not die. Yes. There are people who are afraid to, to, to love food. I, and I hear this in so many marriages. It's so heartbreaking. Where young women, because of all the painful, hurtful things they've heard, enter their own marriages and define it by those hurtful things and decide me, I love only 50%. And I've heard people say, is that in the Bible anywhere? Your marriage has failed before you started. Show your heart. Be genuine. Let people know who you are, where you stand. Yes, they will hurt you. We can't save you from that. You, are, you, you must get hurt. If you don't get hurt, you're not a human being. Be heartbroken. Fall down a few times. Be disappointed. Be betrayed. I was having a conversation with friends on an uh, old school platform. And they were speaking from their hearts. And they were talking about this, this whole conversation about submission and love. You know, yeah, I can submit, but the man has to love me. God doesn't have those kind of rules. Because there are many men who want to love, except the woman submits. You can't do that. Yours as a child of God is to follow his word. Take his instruction. And then trust that he will bring into your life somebody who matters. And yes, sometimes the best relationships fail. Be ready to give second chances to the worst people. Yes. Honestly. <laughs> I saw the shock in your face. That's what <laughs> no, seriously. Some of the best relationships or fastest friendships have come because one friend was forgiving enough to give it another try. Ah, then you can't get married though. Because the whole marriage from A to B you will be hurting. Uh, it, look, it's, marriage is about forgiveness. So you have to become professional forgivers. <laughs> Ladies, learn. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I kid you not. You'll be forgiving from day one. Not because you like it, but because it's necessary to the angry. <laughs> Guys, forgive you. <laughs> because <laughs> there is no way marriage can work outside of forgiveness. I think that's precisely why God gave it to us. So if for you, you've got different rules, then I, there's nothing to teach here or learn here. Thank you very much.
Hello. So I'm told there's a Q&A session. Please feel free to ask me any questions. I shall, to the best of my ability, answer them honestly. If I don't know to, I'll tell you I don't know. But feel free to ask me anything, please. Anyone? Yes, sir. Um, as I said, it's funny. He said that between your life career, the time that you, you are wanting to have your job, you can teach. But some of us, it is our life career. So should we? <laughs> My apologies. That's not how I meant it. Um, so there, teaching is probably the most important. And, and I, I take this seriously because throughout your life, you spend it teaching if you want to impact anybody or you want to grow any place. But there are many Ghanaian, there are many Ghanaians who do other courses, who choose not to impart it simply because they think it is beneath them. And that's what I was directing my comment at. Um, there, are, there are many people, I, I know a person who has been sitting at home for six years, even though he's had several opportunities to teach. And he refuses to do it because in his mind, that's not that he went to school for an, for a civil engineering and he passed with first class. And he's sitting at home. I, I don't know. That's the mindset I'm trying to address. So my apologies. That 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 thank you for, for speaking up about it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Okay, um my question has to do with I have worked with an institution where the modus operandi of the institution deviates from the kingdom principles. That is the ultimate. So efforts have been made to change the status quo. And then the feedback that you get is that even so so and so couldn't change A, B, and C, how much less of you. So if someone faces such a situation, how can the person handle it? And then secondly, you mentioned the second chance relating to the relationship aspect. So some people associate or relate second chance to uh, a, a, a woman or someone possessed with evil. And then when the person goes, come back with multiples of, I mean, evil spirits or something. So, in that <laughs> issue, how can it be addressed? <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Please, please. Can, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Um, <laughs> so, let me start with the first one. Uh, the second one, I need the Holy Spirit to teach me what to say. <laughs> um, I was told to use the lapel. You can you can't hear me. So, if you're in an organization where they are pointing to someone else who is considered to be have been greater than you for and did not change, that's fine. It's, it's okay. Um, new ventures like these are ventured only by people who believe. And that's why I spent a lot of time talking about certain things that are connected to what we believe. Do you believe that in the audience when the trumpet was sounded on the plain of Dura that there were high priests and Levites on that field? Do you know that? These were people who had come from Israel. There were many royal members of the royal family who knew the true God who bowed to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar that day. But the Bible doesn't remember any of them. Baba remembers these three Hebrew boys with almost unmentionable Babylonian names who chose to stand apart. The one thing that is amazing about our God is that he doesn't have superheroes. They are great people whose example we follow. But none of them is above anyone. And anyone who is willing can become even greater. Jesus said, um, the things I'm doing now, if you are willing, you will do even what? Greater. And he actually gives that promise. 
So there's no, there's no, when it comes to the things of God, there's no standard, there's a standard amount to be kept, but there's no role model who cannot be overtaken. That should not worry you at all. Focus on what you believe. And if you believe it strongly enough, you will be the person who lights the way for many others to follow. So don't worry at all about that one. Um, I remember many years ago at the University of Ghana, it was very difficult to actually write exams. Um, I remember I actually missed out on quite a number of my IEs because they were on Saturdays. And actually, there was a final exam that I nearly missed because it was going to be written on a Sabbath. Do you know that time we kept praying and asking God to change it? Some of them, they didn't change. I remember a particular exam, it did not change. I lost my eye and I did not pass at the grade I wanted to, even though that was a subject that I thought I could have done very well. Do I trust God less because of that? Not at all. Because with that story, I was able to, you know, you know when people stand up and say, oh, you know, that exam, I wrote it on that Saturday and because I, I honored the Lord, I got an A in it. You know, there are many people who don't get A's. Are you aware? And those people, do you know how they cry inside them that God, you are not hearing me? So when somebody who also believes and is regarded comes to confess that I wrote that exam but I bombed, it doesn't make God any less. It is encouragement and helps others stand. Now I'm not praying that that should be your, your case, but understand that God is not limited for how he should work. And if you commit yourself to him, you will... That's why it's important to understand this because there were many people who God had shown visions to who chose not to speak up before E.G. White came along. Actually, she speaks of about three or four others who had been given the same visions, who confirmed it to her years after she actually spoke them. And God showed it to me, but I was too frightened to tell. Don't let people limit you. The, last, the next one is on the marriage thing. Of course, there are some things you cannot do a second chance on. I'm, I'm not saying that because you, second chance, then you had everything. Second. That's what I'm saying. But there are things that you can forgive. And too many relationships and marriages are broken simply because we choose not to forgive. I'm saying be open-minded about it. Um, I think life is better when we hurt each other, but we say sorry, we learn, we grow, and all of that. That's what I mean. Thank you. Okay, so make the declaration now and learn to wait. Remember, not idly, because you'll never know. Preparing for Eternity by Mr. Ni Amankra Tete. God bless you very much, Mr. Ni Amankra Tete. And it's now. God or job, name or fame, health or wealth. Can you imagine? It's going to be great. If it's 6 p.m., please let's all assemble here for the next presentation by Mr. ITV Tete. Thank you very much for staying put. Please let's bow down our heads as we close this session. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege given us to listen to this wonderful presentation. Please help us to do uh, what we were told and help us to abide by what we have just learned. We pray that you bless Mr. Ni Amankratete and his family and give them the strength to fight for what is good in their lives. We bless your name for listening to our prayers. In Jesus' name, have we prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. Please, um, Seraphs, or Psalmist Jude, give us a departure song.